So generally our goal is to um, support as wide a range of use cases as possible. And so our, our goal is many, in many ways to try to make programming zero knowledge systems as easy as possible for ordinary programmers. And we also intend to, like we have the SHA-256 accelerator, add accelerators for other common cryptographic operations that would be too slow to run using the RISC-V processor directly. Although technically, you could technically run anything on the RISC-V processor, obviously, um, you know, you get huge wins from putting direct support in a circuit for those accelerations. Um, we intend longer term to support a generic mechanism for allowing additional circuits to be added and associated with custom instructions within the RISC-V uh, ISA, because the RISC-V ISA has uh, innate support for um, sort of e custom instruction uh, extensions. And uh, to that extent, we are interested in supporting as wide a range of things as is possible. Um, certainly, some things are easier, will be easier, or more difficult based on the finite fields that our proof systems ends up using and so on. Um, but that said, um, you know, as much as we can uh, within reason. And hopefully, we'll be getting community contributions from this as well. I should also mention, I don't know if we explicitly said it yet, um, but that all of this does currently already exist and is running. You can actually run these proofs right now. We fully support the risk five. Um, ISA and pass all the conformance tests by the risk five group. So, um, you know, this is what we're talking about here is not a thing we're building. It's a thing that we have built uh, by and large. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit in detail about sort of how we actually implement uh, effectively the um, uh, actual risk five circuit, including particularly how we deal with uh, RAM and how we uh, emulate RAM within the, the proof system, um, as well as a little bit about sort of um, the, the, the structure of our proof system. Our administration is more or less similar to AIR, but with some slight differences. So I'm gonna cover a little bit of that as well. Um, so I'm gonna make the assumption sort of that most everyone is probably familiar at a high level with how Starks work. Um, uh, so feel free to ask any questions. So um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is how we represent the program uh, that the user passes us, the ELF, uh, and the loading of that within the proof system, as well as sort of the overall structure uh, from a time perspective to how the processor itself works. So um, the notion here is that we uh, uh, divide the, so, so starts are naturally sort of divided into cycles and there's a repetitive um, sort of arithmetic circuit that relates each cycle to the previous cycle. Um, within the execution of a given program in our system, there's sort of this process by which initially there's a, there's a special initialization cycle that sort of um, resets the state. Then there's what we call the program load phase, wherein we're effectively loading the, uh, the program data uh, for the particular ELF into our uh, emulated memory. Um, and then we sort of do a reset, which jumps the program counter to the beginning of the execution. And then basically the actual processor uh, takes three cycles uh, to execute uh, each instruction, which is basically composed of instruction to code, and then a compute slash load phase, and then a register update slash uh, write to memory phase. Uh, what's notable is that uh, effectively, we always have uh, at most one memory transaction for each logical cycle, which is important to the way that we actually implement the memory system. Yeah, under the hood. Yeah, it might be helpful to say just at a very high level that your, your goal is to let someone write a C program. That's right. Compile it down to um, to RISC five. Five. Yes. Yes. And then just run the prover as is. Exactly. Yep. So, so see the proof. System. That's right. Exactly. That's what the system to do. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. And I, I. So that is. Um, so, so I think one of the great things about this is that by using this sort of mechanism, we then look like a normal computer uh, to people and people can reuse the existing software. Um, they, we, we're reusing a huge amount of the existing tool chain in terms of compilers um, and language support. Um, and I'll also get into a little bit uh, about the way in which we do the interactions between the system running inside the proof system and the outside world. Uh, so that's obviously an important how you how you talk to the Oracle and so oh, on. I should have mentioned this also, Jeremy, you mentioned uh, that on our website, not in GitHub, there's like a full write-up of how the battleship example works. Yeah. Uh, which sort of is like if you want to 
go home and read more about this. This will sort of re reinforce your uh, reading of that particular uh, explainer. Um, all right, so one of the things that's notable is that, uh, so in, in your, you know, Stark, there's typically a set of columns which represent sort of, you know, like a, a like a hardware register, if you will, over time. Uh, every, you know, at every, at a, every given cycle that each of those columns has a value. Um, we actually divide the um, set of columns that we use into three distinct groups of columns. And each group of columns actually is uh, put into a separate Merkle tree. Um, well, so the first set of columns are actually what we call the, the code columns. And those columns represent public data that is known to both the prover and the verifier. And this is actually how, where we encode both the control um, sort of flags that say, okay, well, this is the initialization cycle. These are the load cycles. These are the, the, the sort of three cycle um, structure of the execution, as well as where we put the actual ELF data that's to be loaded. Um, and so uh, by doing that, we're basically able to put uh, all of our sort of control logic into that set of columns. And that's part of the, 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 the Merkle tree that is checked in the proof system similar to the main data Merkle tree, but because they have different Merkle roots, we do have to, as a result, we end up having to prove two Merkle paths instead of one when we were doing the verification. Um, but what that allows us is it allows us to fit a huge amount of, um, uh, you know, um, constant data in and make the proof system be able to make use of all of that, which is important. So that otherwise we'd have to say, for example, you know, prove that our code hashes to some value, which would be much more expensive, right? So that's kind of a, uh, a good trick there. Um, Maybe a related question mm -hmm. on the chat. Yes. Do you also implement control and status registers? Uh, so interestingly, the risk five, uh, oh, the, 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 the control status registers within the risk five architecture. Yeah. So currently we don't, uh, although we are going to add support for the, um, because we only operate in user mode effectively and the normal mechanisms by which one calls into um, the, uh, uh, system modes uh we actually just implement as that's what induces the termination of the program that's like effectively the halt instruction um in our next version of the circuit uh we do intend to support the csr registers uh including the standard sort of timer registers uh as well as uh uh so we don't intend to support the full um the, the the system mode but we also do intend to use the normal system call mechanism to do our interactions with the external world Currently, we use this memory mapping trick uh, to do our interactions with the external world. Um, Another follow-up question on this: Is the program by default a public input? Yes. So the program is by default a public input. Uh, now, technically, the only thing you need to do the verification is the uh, Merkle root of the control uh, set of columns. So, in theory, one could for example, pad your program with a bunch of extra random bytes and then generate the, 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 the appropriate Merkle root. Um, but, the, but, but certainly the prover needs to know the program um, and the verifier needs to know the hash of the program's uh, sort of control traces in order to um, do verification. Um, so you could technically verify a program that you don't know what the program is. Uh, tip, none of our use cases do we make use of that back. All right. Uh, although I will add just briefly that there you can imagine use cases oh, where, yeah. where some very some say you know governmental or otherwise trusted body audits a bit of code and attests to some bit of code having certain properties and says this code that has this hash has these properties and then people can run it prove that the results come from this bit of code. Yeah. Um, without necessarily ever revealing the code, but that's like a. a I don't know, future use case, yeah. let's say. Um, <clears throat> so then the, the, the next set of sort of columns uh, represent uh, the sort of standard, you know, columns you'd have in any sort of a Stark, and they hold the state of the risk five uh, during execution. And they also hold the information necessary to do the memory transactions, as well as the memory verification, which I'll get to in a bit. Um, and then we basically have the uh, effectively accumulation set of columns, which basically hold products for the Planck um, you know, permutation verification mechanism. Uh, so we use a we use a we use a basically a Planck style way to prove a permutation, which is used as part of the memory consistency evaluate, uh, evaluation. Um, Actually, is yep, there anything in the RISC-V 
construction and stuff that's not supported in the control side? No. So well, so currently the we fully passed the risk five compliance test for the uh, R thirty two VM or IM. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, so. Uh, I mean, aside from the, so for the user space set of instructions, uh, we fully support them all. Um, some of them are no ops, like for example, the memory fence doesn't do anything, right? But but it does, it does, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so. But yeah, it generally you should, you can literally compile down random C code. And you can actually even use floating point because we actually support uh, a very uh, basic version of Pico libc. Um, I can write a bunch of floating point code and it'll get converted into soft float and put into the system. We actually are seriously considering in the next version of the circuit adding um, the uh, proper floating point extensions um, because with lookup now, um, I, I think that the actual FP unit, while an annoyingly complex engineering task in terms of the total size expansion for the circuit isn't super huge. And one of the nice things is because the circuit definition itself is part of the, the verifier and the prover, we can actually have different versions of the circuit. So we could, for example, have optional floating point support. So if you want to use a lot of floating point, you pay for a bigger circuit, but then your floating point is much cheaper. If you don't have much floating point, you can use the smaller circuit that doesn't have the FP support. As part of the reason, so, so you know, largely risk five as the architecture was sort of just, we just sort it was sort of lucky. It's just a very nice modern architecture. It's modular. Um, it's really built for having the minimal set be implementable on a tiny amount of digital logic, which means that it's also implementable in a tiny amount of arithmetic circuits. Um, you know, uh, it's not like the most perfect architecture for ZK, but it's it's actually pretty reasonable. So I actually have a question now, Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so this means if you, what's the size of the risk five circuit relative to say Shaw accelerator? If you don't care about recursion on blockchains, for oh, instance, like the, uh, how much smaller does that circuit get? Uh, it, I think that I I don't have an exact number because I haven't actually measured that, but my guess off the top of my head is that the risk five circuit is probably about 60% of the circuit. Oh, wow. Okay. The shock so accelerator, shy, it's a, the accelerator yeah. does take actually a fair amount of constraints because yeah. it, it's I, it's not trivial. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a very good point. We should really make that an optional. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Optimize that. Genius. All right. <laughs> I don't know why that never occurred to me. All right. So uh, I wanted to talk now in detail about sort of the mechanism that we're using to do the memory validation. So as we mentioned earlier, um, there are, uh, we're effectively doing at most one memory transaction per, uh, per execution cycle. And honestly, if we don't have a specific memory transaction, we just do a read of memory address zero or whatever as a default. So there's always, always one memory transaction per, per cycle. Um, so there are, uh, there, are, there are two sets of columns. They're both in the data section. Um, one of them is the uh, sort of um, memory operations and those occur in program order. Um, and so there's a sort of cycle of which 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 logical cycle this is, and that just moves forward, you know, monotonically. And there's a constraint that that always moves forward monotonically. And then there's basically the address, the data, and a write read write flag, which of course have constraints that are hooked into the rest of the circuit. So so that basically um, just real picture. Yep. If, you, if you do, uh, if oh, you, like, I can do this. If you yes. do this, you can like. Oh yeah, there you go. Do a pointer thing that everybody will see, and hopefully the there we go. Yeah. So this is the yeah. This is the cycle. This is the this is the normal ordered. So this is all happens in cycle order. And so what we're saying here is okay. At time zero, I'm going to do a write to address three of the value seventeen, and then at time one, I'm going to do a write at the address seven of the value three. Then of course later, I'm going to read from address three, and uh, I'm going to read back. 17, or at least I should, assuming memory is valid, right? So what happens is during the initial program execution, we generate these columns um, and we just model memory externally, right? Uh, then what we do is after execution, we do a sort of all of the values in here into this uh, sort of verifiers, uh, this was a second copy of the memory transactions. But these are, instead of being sorted by cycle, are sorted by address first, uh, and cycle second in lexicographic sort order. Um, what that means is that all of the uh, memory transactions that occur on the same address are all now located next to each other and all of them are in, in proper cycle order. At which point, basically it's possible to quickly verify the validity of the memory transactions. Oh wait, you know what? This should actually be a one, shouldn't it? Yes. Oh, shoot. I guess I can't edit this document while I'm doing this. Sorry, this is a one. I didn't remember that. This is a one right here, yes. Um, 
Uh, so, so, so what you'll see is we write 17 and then we read it twice. And then here we write two different values and read it. And interestingly, the requirements for the, verif the, the verified verifier are basically written here. They're actually fairly simple. If the addresses are the same, um, then we have to verify that the cycle is moving forward. Uh, and if it's, uh, if it's not a right, we have to make sure that it matches whatever the previous value was. Um, and then also that uh, if the, um, otherwise, if they're switching between addresses, the only thing we care about is the addresses are going up. Um, you, you will note, by the way, that this allows the, an initial read prior to a write to return any value whatsoever, which we actually take advantage of. Basically, un, basically reads of values never written are in fact undefined. And we, we use that actually as a way to interact with the external world. Um, so the, basically, in addition to, so, so, so besides uh, the, 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 the set of um, constraints that represent the verification of the sorted version, resorted versions of the address, we also have to prove, of course, that these two different um, tables are in fact permutations of each other. Um, which we do using the sort of clock permutation argument, um, where we basically commit to the entire state of the data uh, trace Merkle tree, and we use that and the Pyatt-Schmier sort of you know mechanism to then uh, you know pick a number uh, you know a set of, of of ways of. I won't go through the Planck argument in detail. I'm sure people have read the paper, and if not, it's a great paper. Um, so uh, at any rate, there is a question. Yep, on the chat. How do you efficiently check the inequality? Ah, if we don't efficiently check the inequality, we actually, what we do is we subtract and then we bit decompose the, so if we want to prove that A is greater than B or greater than equal, we'll say, we take A, we subtract B, and then we bit decompose it and prove that it is a 20 bit number. And so since our field is like 30, you know, one odd bits, uh, if they're the wrong way, then it's not a 20 bit number. And so it fails to constraint check. Now we're going to replace that with plookup, which will allow us to very rapidly do that with only with a much smaller number of columns and a much smaller number of constraints. But right now we actually spend like 20 columns for the bit decomposition of the subtractant. Um, and we actually reuse that. So the, the interestingly, we use the same set of columns for these two different cases because they're never simultaneously true, right? So. There is a fair amount of, um, I, you know, given that we already are using, um, you know, Planck for memory verification, you would think that the idea of plookup would have been self-evident to us when we were writing this the first time, but uh, it was not, unfortunately. So we're building a new version of the circuit for that. Um, cool. All right, next uh, slide here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how we do the interaction between the uh, actual ZKVM, which we call the guest, in sort of standard, you know, virtual machine kind of terms, and the sort of prover, which is the host, from a sort of a normal uh, term. So, so let's say we want to have the guest send something to the host. Well, the guest just writes to an address that is um, a particular well-known address, and the host is like, "Oh yeah, I see you right there," right? Because obviously it's just running an emulation. The host can see the whole world, so trivial. On, on the other hand, if we want to get something from the host to the guest, then the guest reads, uh, there's a region of memory that we set aside for uh, host to guest communications. And we keep the, the guest keeps track of a pointer and it keeps bumping that pointer and reading the next address. And as it reads those addresses, um, since those addresses have never been written to before, they're uninitialized, any value is allowed to be returned. And so right when that address is read, at that moment, the host will decide what uh, it would like the guest to read and places that in there. Um, we use this to basically generate what is effectively a um, sort of a private two-way stream, which we actually, um, currently we have sort of our own sort of read and write calls, but we're actually going to um, move that to actually uh, inside of libc so that they'll actually be like real like things that look like file descriptors that you can read and write to, to like talk to the host of the guest um, uh, and, and things like that. Um, and then we're going to also implement a number of other sort of um, systems on top of that. Uh, well, I, I probably won't go into detail that, but if you're anyone's interested in how do you can build like something that looks like a file system uh, inside of a, a zero knowledge proof system, we do actually have a, a plan for that even. Um, so I don't think, do I talk about, uh, I, I didn't, no, I didn't. Skip the slide. Yeah, slide this is the booth. Know, so. I think that's it. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention is, it's not explicitly written here, but I think it's one interesting note on the model is that the other sort of interaction between the proof system and the outside world is this thing we call the um, the journal. 
So basically there's another region of memory that the guest writes to. And at the termination of the guest from the normal execution, we go into the SHA accelerator circuit where we uh, SHA up that, that region. And that ends up coming onto the output of the proof. So effectively the, the basically, uh, if you wanna talk privately to the host, you can read and write to these sort of logical streams. And then there's also this other region that you can write things you want to be publicly known. And then those get basically um, uh, emitted and those become part of the public record. So when you provide a proof, the, you're basically showing what, what is the journal? What did this thing write to the journal? What is the code that this thing is running? And then a bunch of sort of opaque cryptographic goo that basically um, allows you to verify the correctness of that. Okay, yeah. Yeah. that now. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Are there more questions right now? Otherwise, uh, Tim is going to talk uh, about uh, formal verification. Actually, so so one, one thing that's not clear to me is um, um, so normally when you write for a for a zero knowledge prover, you know you you don't do computation. You provide witnesses that things were done correctly. So you're writing a verifier. So for example, if your C code like in your in your battleship game, yep. Maybe there's a well, battleship game is not the greatest example, but imagine you need to do a sorting algorithm. You would never implement the sorting algorithm inside of the circuit. You would right. Just <laughs> sort outside yes. and, and have a device proof. Yes. So so, so how, how is that we use here? what we, we we the way we do that is that if you wanted to, for example, we actually were just talking about trying to get a compiler to fit inside of the zero knowledge system. And like one of the examples that comes up is oh, well, register allocation is very expensive and complicated, but verifying register allocation is actually a lot cheaper, right? So you can use this sort of non-determinism mechanism in any of these things. And the way that that works in terms of uh, how we implement that within the ZKVM is that inside the guest code, inside the ZKVM, the ZKVM will write to the host saying, hey, I would like you to solve this problem. And at that point, by the way, the, the host can just read in any location and in memory just to see whatever it needs to see. And then the, the host will write back the result, which the guest will read, and then the guest will verify whatever it is, right? So what we're, we're still in the process of building a sort of a set of like wrappers. Like for example, we're, we're, we've been considering in Rust having a macro mechanism where you can say like, you can basically you know, decorate that this method is meant to run on the host and then sort of kind of do all of the um, the back and forth between the host uh, and the, uh, the the guest, uh, like you know, so that you can basically say, okay, well, I want I want this is what I want to run, and this is how I want to verify the thing I ran, right? Um, and so you can basically do these sort of blocks where you're like. Uh, allow you to, to do that acceleration kind of technique. I guess you could then like implement parts of like the C++ standard library too. Yes. If you wanted to and have various sorting algorithms or whatever. Yes, exactly. You uh, could do yes yeah. sort and then you say, okay, here, I want to call sort. The actual host or the guest is going to, sorry, host is going to do the sorting. And the sort, the guest is then going to place that back into your memory. Um, and then you're going to do a quick walk through it to verify. Although I guess, in that, sorry, yes. I'm not following this, but we just use file descriptors eventually, right? You yeah. write, write all of your list you want sort of yeah. to a file and then- you, can, just, you do that, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's all kinds of ways to, there's all kinds of ways to do that. Our, our fundamental literature is figuring out how to get as many of these metaphors to be as easy for developers to use, yeah. right? Right. So, um, uh, and, and, and so currently, you know, we, we don't really do a lot of these, like the Battleship game, for example, we just like, the way it works is that, you read in where the, the user wants to place their ships. And then we just uh, verify that that placement of ships doesn't have any ships overlapping. It has all the ships, none of them go off the edge of the board. And then we basically, uh, and if any of those things are the case, we, there's sort of, a, there's sort of a, um, an abort. Uh, that we define a, uh, a, an illegal instruction um, will make it impossible to produce a proof because if you execute an illegal instruction, the circuit will fail. And so then it's impossible. So, so what we basically do is we basically say, oh, well, if you have a bad board state, then abort, otherwise terminate normally. And then basically you have a proof now that the, that the user has committed to where to place their ships. And then we basically, as write, we write to the journal, the hash of that ship placement plus a hidden secret so that you can't do hash inversion on it. And, you know, I guess Bob's your uncle, right? So, um, yeah. The, the other question I had, sorry, I'll just ask one more. So I think I asked you on, on the way here, like, uh, so why, why choose risk, risk, the risk architecture 
for for example, this has all these registers, which you couldn't care less yep. about. You don't need registers here. True. So why not rip that all out and kind of just define so your own? Need to yeah. So the question is, is why why pick an existing ISA as opposed to basically building a zk specific new ISA? And honestly, the answer to that is. Um, so in back of the envelope shows we probably only, you know, are losing like two or three X performance by using something that already exists. And, and now all of our tool chain is already done. Um, so it's primarily a time to market thing and an, and an ease of understanding for existing programmers. Like right this second, I now have a huge library of Rust code that already compiles and works in this system, right? No one needs to port any code. No one needs to build a new compiler backend. All that's done. Now, at some point, will we, you know, maybe it would make sense for us to build an LLVM backend that supports a new architecture um, that is specifically optimized for zero knowledge proof systems and then implement that architecture and implement the LLVM lowerings. But there's a lot more engineering to do for that. Yeah. And um, at the end of the day, you know, um, what, what's cool is that if we are using something that's a normal, architecture like RISC-V and people thus program in normal languages like Rust and C++. If we do end up switching to another architecture, it's, you know, most of that code should port across effectively. Um, so, 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 and, and to be honest, you know, I do think the total cost of using RISC-V is actually not particularly huge and it's a big accelerant in terms of time to market. Yeah, you also mentioned the, um, the existing battery of tests. Oh yeah, that's huge, another right? huge thing, and right? The tool chain and the extension mechanisms and all these things are like well supported throughout the tool chain. So yes, it, and it, actually, it's there's quite there's, a large accelerator market. There's a formal description of what it means to be risk five, so we can actually formally verify that our ISA, which is a perfect segue to yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, two more questions yeah, yeah. on the chat. Sure. The first one: Can you share any tricks you use to implement SHA two fifty six? Oh yes, uh, <laughs> we should need to do a write up on that. We, we 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 actually yes, I've I've heard of this question enough that I do think we should do a write up. The short version is that if you look at the uh, state of SHA two fifty six, there's sort of a set of registers that there's eight of them and they most of them are sort of like shifting back uh, every cycle and then two new elements are created. Um, if you unroll that in time so that you place uh, effectively two elements, um, uh, you make two new elements every time and then you read back some number of cycles. Um, so the one thing about Starks is they have this repetitive structure, but most of the time people only go back one cycle in Starks. But you can go back as many seconds as you want. And so if you unroll the SHA-256 in time, you actually only need to uh, produce uh, uh, a, a, a the re regenerate two new registers. So it doesn't take very many columns. And then we basically bit decompose them. So we basically take 96 columns, which gives us the, the, the two new registers, A and D, plus also there's this W register, which is related to itself. It's the, um, and so basically, you basically take was 96 bits, and then we can fit everything into rank three constraints. Um, and you take 60 cycles or something, or 68 uh, cycles to do a full uh, SHA, uh, one, yeah. one round, or not one round, one um, compression, one, one full compression. The second question on the chat is, uh, how do you compare to tiny brand? Uh, so yeah, largely the idea of use of, 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 of von Neumann architecture um, using sort of zero knowledge proof systems that TinyRAM does is very similar. Uh, the primary differences are that we are implementing an existing ISA as opposed to some new ISA. And then also the way in which the permutation validation was done on that uh, was a Binet network or Binesh network. How do you say that? Binesh, yeah. Whereas, whereas in this case, we're using the, the Planck. So there's a, the, the Planck mechanism for verifying the permutation is massively more efficient uh, in terms of prover time uh, as well as verification complexity. So, um, but, but at, a, at, a, at, at the heart, the conceptual notion of, the, of, of verifying RAM via permutation is similar. And there's the last question on the mm -hmm. chat. Is there any limitation on the recursion call depth? Uh, no, no, uh, it's, it's really, it's just emulating a normal RISC-V processor. Um, I mean, so there is, I, we only have two megs of RAM, so your stack can only get so big. Uh, and, and of course, also the finite field for the FFTs, there's a maximal number of cycles you can run within a single instantiation before you, you know, but, but effectively, no, we're not doing any tricks with um, control structures or anything. It's literally just random machine code. Like you can do indirect jumps, you can do, like you can actually do self-modifying code if you wanted to. Now we actually, yeah. 
because 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 the, 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 the red it's, it's, it's yeah. read from ram right so you read the read it through lt into ram and then if it's in ram you can modify it now technically we actually have two different regions of memory one which is write once which is the what we used for the program codes so that we actually will seg fault if you try to write to your own program code because we think that the chances that someone wants to correctly use self-modifying code versus someone's being hacked by self-modifying code we probably err on the side of making it not writable but in theory one could in fact generate code in the data segment and then jump into it and it would actually work the whole nine yards it's like a real von neumann machine well, what was the biggest number of, of cycles that you can handle in a single group uh, so uh, uh, the maximum, so we, our finite field is uh, 15 times two to the 27 uh, plus one. Um, and we do a 4X expansion. Uh, so that means we have two to the 25. Uh, so what, uh, 32 million uh, cycles. So every, so. And there's, there's three, in three cycles per instruction. So about 10 million instructions is, is the maximum you can do in, a, in our current proof system. Now, now we're, we're likely, we're, we're thinking, I think the next version of the circuit, we're going to switch to using the, the, uh, the so-called uh, Goldilocks field, although that was also used for a, a previous field. Uh, but in this case, that represents the field two to the 64 minus two to the 32 plus one, at which point um, we could do larger proofs. This, um, yeah. 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 I think you mentioned something like char accelerator. Is, is it a hardware accelerator? So no, no, it's just it's just I, what I mean by that is it is a uh, component of the arithmetic circuit that sits next to the arithmetic circuit that represents the the, the stepping of the risk five. That is uh, that. Uh, uh, so when we when you run a when you do a shot two fifty six, there's basically some weird dance you can do where you you know sort of uh, execute certain instructions and poke certain memory that like basically induces the machine to verify a shy inside the circuit. Uh, but it's not, none, none, none of our stuff involves any hardware acceleration in real hardware. It's all the imaginary sort right. of- it's like, it's like you're making a, um, it's like, just like any standard, like, like microcontroller, like microprocessor these days has like, who knows how many functional units, like mm -hmm. actually on the die. This is basically a mechanism to make new functional units on your, arithmetic die and then yes. and then call them like you would uh, in a you know in yeah. your standard like standard gigantic yeah. intel chip and, and notably right now all of our stuff runs on cpu multi-threaded in terms of the open source implementations we do have uh commercial uh, you know a non-open source uh, implementations that are gpu accelerated that make the proof system significantly faster using gpu acceleration um, but otherwise everything else we've got is open source apache 2 license but in 10 million cycles was for gpu or for uh, uh, what, one million cycles was uh, per second was for um Large, yeah, large, yes. Large that was for that was for GPU. Yeah, it's, no, uh, it's a, about thirty thousand. That's the clock of the VM. Yeah. Yes. The uh, this number of cycles is constant. It's ten million because of the finite field. Yes. Yeah. The yeah the speed of the emulated circuit yes. is ten megahertz or one megahertz on a GPU or like yes. thirty so kilohertz. This is yeah. the running time. So if I do have a program that runs for ten million cycles, how yes. long does it take to generate? Uh, like on the order of twenty seconds, I guess. Uh, yeah. Um, was that right? No. Uh, well, it depends upon. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's about, about right. Yeah. So fast or slow? Okay. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I want to make sure Tim has time to. Yep. Let's stuff. do it. One more question from the chat. Okay. Doesn't the Planck argument depend on being defined over a very large field, much larger than the degree so of the polynomial? Correct. And what we do is we so we use uh, for the Planck argument for the. Um, so we use a small field for the, the most of the circuit, but then when we do the deep alley uh, component of the, uh, the Stark proof, uh, as well as for Planck, as well as for the Fry, we use an extension, a field extension. I mean, in our case, because we're using a 30 bit field, we use an extension, um, a field extension of four, and we're basically targeting about a hundred bits of security in our current implementation. Okay. 